All right. It's been a long day. I appreciate everybody's uh, work. We have three uh, um, items left to accomplish today. We have some administrative issues that Tom will uh, lead us through. We're going to discuss um, today's hearing, in particular, uh, further areas of research and study that we want the uh, staff to uh, work on in developing a recommendation, and then we'll have public comment. All right. So uh, moving ahead, just a quick, the very quickest administrative item is to approve the minutes. I'm going to move to approve the minutes. Will somebody second it from March 20? Excuse me, from our March 17th meeting. Second. Any opposed? Okay, they're approved. Uh, next, Tom. Uh, will you please give us an uh, update about uh, the legislative activity that's ongoing right now related to our recommendations? Um, any updates you might want to give on uh, crime stats, which I think are important for us to be on top of, and uh, any work that we've been doing with California Policy Lab? Yeah, let's do it. So the legislative update, you know, um, we uh, everything got out of its first house that's going to get out basically at this point, and we've got... Uh, six bills or other actions that were still um, either based on supported by a committee recommendation, uh, ranging from parole to uh, a bill that Assembly member Brian is doing about a uh, notice about restorative justice programs, SB 50, which would be um, a, 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 a ending stops for technical traffic violations based on the research we, we looked at from the RIPA board, and of course, continuing uh, support for MCRP, CCTRP reentry programs. So this is sort of what's on the docket now. Uh, and you know, knock on wood, this is what it'll look like in a in a few months. So that's sort of where we are. Unless anybody has any questions, I'll keep moving. Nick, keep moving. But I do want to say that um, Tom and Natasha and um, Joy and Rick, others have been working very hard on this. So thank you all to everybody who's been pushing these through. Something member Brian, of course. And lots of other advocates and others uh, throughout the state too. Yeah. Um, so uh, next, I want to just talk about three reports that have come out since the Penal Code Committee last met in March. The first, this, these are all with the California Policy Lab. The first was about sentencing enhancements, and you all got a, uh, an overview of that at the meeting in March, but the full report came out uh, shortly thereafter. And then two smaller um, pieces that came out. One came out uh, in April and the other in May. And the one in April was an overview of what happened to prison and jail populations uh, during COVID-19. And I'll share one quick fact wait about that in a sec. And the third one came out uh, in May, and it's related to SB 50, which is the pending bill about um, technical traffic violations. And it really uh, looked into the differences in racial disparities between California Highway Patrol, which accounts for about half a stops, and then local law enforcement agencies. When you look at those local agencies, the disparities got even more stark. So um, hopefully a helpful um, piece of research for the SB 50 discussion. Uh, so I just want to show two things, the one about the prison and carcer, prison and jail rate. So this is the this is 100 years of the imprisonment rate in California, going back to 1925. And this is the imprisonment rate. So it's controlled for population. So, you know, as we got more people, uh, it, it controls for that. And you can see, you know, we've looked at this chart 100 times probably by now, but I thought it was interesting to look back 100 years and you can sort of see, you know, these different fluctuations, but then there's this huge spike in the in the late 70s, 80s and 90s, even as much as we've come down, we're still, you know, at a pretty historically high rate. Um, and this chart here is zooming in on sort of the last 10 years from realignment to COVID-19. You can sort of see uh, how realignment, which is that first dotted line affected the prison population, Prop 47, and then some of the things done in COVID-19. And what happened with COVID-19, a year later, there's a 23% difference in the population, which is the equivalent of both realignment and Prop 47 combined. So the biggest thing that led to a uh, reduction in our prison population was things done around COVID-19, even bigger than realignment, which, which by itself was about a 17% drop. So just some of the, uh, the research we're working with uh, CPL to get out there. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention before getting into proposals was what Mike said about uh, violent crime reports. So, um, you know, statewide crime reports don't come out until the summer after the year they completed. So we're going to get 2022 information, you know, maybe next month, maybe maybe the month after that soon. That'll be 2022. But so what we've tried to do is find sources that are a little more timely. Um, and there is an organization of uh, uh, police chiefs called the Major, Major Cities Chiefs Association that canvasses uh, the largest cities across the country and, and puts the information together for violent crime. So wh why this is helpful is because it includes information that isn't otherwise publicly available. And they put out a report for the first quarter, so January to March, comparing this year to last year in the same time. 
and the news on violent crime is really good, particularly on, on homicide. And what we've uh, uh, broken out here is all violent crime in the eight largest uh, cities in California is down 7% in the first quarter versus only 4% in the rest of the country. And we also looked at the cities that were just in LA County where it's down 6% and you can see um, down in every category and the drops in homicide are, I mean, really big, double digits. Um, now this is just the first quarter could change. This is just some cities in California may not be representative of the state, but I think uh, worth knowing and worth thinking about. And in fact, uh, there've been a couple articles about how the homicide rate is continuing to go down in these amounts through the whole country and it's sort of unprecedented. Um, so that's sort of what we know about violent crime so far and I'll keep you all updated as uh, time marches on. Um, and then should we move to the Proposals, Mike, anything else you want to talk about before we dive into this? The proposals for today? For from last time, sort of. Oh no. <clears throat> Go ahead. Okay. So there, there are five things. Um, and you know, I assume you all have read the, the memo. So we'll we'll go very quickly. And these are all ideas that came out of the meeting we had in March, looking back at uh recent changes and reforms to the criminal law in the state. So these were five things that uh we identified make make sense as proposals. And, and Joy, in particular, has worked a lot on these. So the first is to create general resentencing procedures. So every time we have you know, a new resentencing law, there's some things that are addressed specifically in the law, some things that are left out and sort of have to get hashed out via litigation. It just seems like a better way is to have general procedures that apply to all resentencing so that we can be consistent and efficient. Um, and we've laid out you know, sort of seven categories of these things. We heard a lot today, actually, about uh, the first one, which is sort of meet regularly with the stakeholders. Not everybody has to agree about everything, but if you have a venue and a channel to work out things, it can be very helpful. And we would include CDCR in there because you know what we heard in March was a lot of delay in these cases is getting those records from CDCR. And of course, Mike could talk to us about that for a long time, I'm sure. But you know, having them as part of the stakeholder conversations. Number two is uh, allowing for specialized courts. I think um, you know it may not be a one size fits all. So at least have the presiding judge have to make a decision. Are we going to have one judge or a series of judges do this? Is it going to be random? Let's 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 have a procedure here because um, I think there was a lot of discussion about the pros and cons of specialized courts, um, but it should it be it should be a thoughtful decision. Require appointment of counsel. I think that one speaks for itself. Uh, coordination of CDCR in particular. Uh, there's something in federal law that says the Bureau of Prisons has to give assistance for people filing essentially resentencing petitions. So something like that to um, sort of ease the way to get records and similar things. Again, some of these get very technical, but are super important. So when you get resentenced, the prison has to be told about it quickly, you know, within the same day and do it electronically or within 48 hours so that if you're going to get released, if you get time served, that's going to be what happens. You don't have to wait around for weeks or months after. And make sure everything applies to plea bargains. Um, and then number seven is clarity on type of hearing. Uh, just make clear that if we're going to look at everything in a sentence, that's what should be happening when you come back for resentencing. It's not a piecemeal thing um, that you get a, a full resentencing hearing, which is what the law basically already says, but should be in the penal code. So any questions on that one? I'll just keep moving unless somebody stops me, basically. Uh, number two is much simpler, luckily, which is apply the nickel uh, prior reform retroactively. So a few years ago, judges were given the ability to, dis to dismiss the five-year nickel prior, which is a very common sentencing enhancement. Uh, it just an, It's an something they would do in the interest of justice. And what we would say as well, if you're still in prison and you were sentenced before that judge had that option to do that, let's let a judge give a chance, uh, opportunity to do that. And as Mike mentioned earlier, um, you know, retroactivity is a common theme for recommendations. It's something uh, that the committee recommended uh, in its first year and became a, a bill around the one and three year priors. So this would be along those and the only, lines. Just to jump in at here is that CDCR is using one of the statutes that we had recommended in our first year, that they give them resentencing authority to try to do some of this in many of the nickel priors and in some of the, they're doing their own retroactivity. We should, this legislature should do it. This it shouldn't be left to CDCR. It's really yeah. not the right way to do it. And I think the reason we honed in on this one too, as I'm sure you all remember, is there is some indication that judges actually are dis are more likely to dismiss these uh, now that they have the ability to, to do so. So um, that's number two. Number three is another follow up on a prior recommendation. This has to do with a, a bill that Senator Skinner uh, um, authored, SB 81, that was based on a recommendation from the committee that said uh, that gave guidance to judges in dismissing sentencing enhancements under Penal Code Section 1385. Um, 
the courts have gotten a hold of this and said, actually, this doesn't apply to prior strikes. So the most common sentencing enhancement is exempt from SB 81 as courts are interpreting it now. So that should just be made clear that, in fact, um, Penal Code Section 3085, you know, the guidance there applies to everything. It isn't limited to uh, things that are called enhancements in a very technical reading of the law. So that one also relatively straightforward. Takes us to number four, which is expand second look uh, resentencing. So the committee made a recommendation in its first report that everyone who had done 15 years and is still in prison should get to go back for resentencing. Um, and I think we looked a little bit back at that in March, uh, and there's been some progress in a few other states we can borrow from a little bit. Um, but the idea is to sort of remake that recommendation uh, and, you know, but maybe have some subgroups. And then we can see a sketch of these here that maybe if we're not going to just do a blanket 15 years, go back, maybe some subgroups, like you allow a judge to reconsider the sentence. So it's not necessarily in the hands of the person who's incarcerated. So that gets a little bit tricky. Or you limit it to people who are uh, developing adults who are under 26 at the time of their offense who've done 15 years. This is what I'll, sort of is the trend in a few other states. Um, and then number three is just the same old thing we did before, which is if you've done 15 years, you can go back for resentencing. So we're going to continue to think about this, and we're, we're hoping to work with the California Policy Lab to look back at the resentencing experiences we've had, look at uh, outcomes from those, and see if there's anything more we can do to identify um, folks who are, from a public safety perspective, should not be in prison anymore because of the amount of time they've done. So this is one we're going to keep developing. I would just thank you, Tom. Super helpful. I don't know if anybody else has comments. I just have two uh, thoughts. Yeah, I have I have one, uh, Michael. All right, go ahead. Actually, I have two. <laughs> well, there's um, one more proposal. Are they? Do we I'm want sorry. to finish go, and go back? Whatever you finish, Tom. I'm sorry. I, in, unless Justice Mary knows about this one. What's about resentencing? Sure. Well, let's let's talk. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, I, you know, just uh, this week, actually last week and this week. Uh, I was the sentencing judge on someone I sentenced to LWAP, who was a major participant in a horrendous uh, murder, robbery, home invasion. Mm. Uh, but he wasn't a shooter. 20 years old, has, has had an exemplary, you know, sort of prison record. This is from 1996 when we had the trial. And I knew the location and everything else. Uh, but I agreed to sign a letter in support of his uh, resentencing after 26 years. Uh, so I think I benefited from some of the discussions we've had here uh, in agreeing after reviewing the uh, sentencing transcript where I said it was a close case. Hmm. And uh, I read the Court of Appeal opinion and other letters in support of what uh, that then young man did. Uh, so that's the one thing. So I, I'm I'm all in favor of the resentencing, particularly the one that you've just outlined on the 15 years uh, broadly to be considered uh, for resentencing. Uh, and, and second, you know, on, on the I just want to comment on what you earlier said about uh, the homicide rates, you know, going down really across the nation, including in California. Uh, you know, the the public's image, though, of crime with, you know, all these mass shootings and killings is that the rates are, crime is still a major, major concern for individuals, but the data actually belies whether and belies the fact that these serious crimes are actually going down. I don't think the public really, really understands that because they're captured by the, all, all the media on these mass shootings we're seeing every day in the country. That's the only observation I want to make uh, on that. But otherwise I'm, I'm fine with the proposals, you know, going forward. That's one of the reasons why we do our, our habit highlighting and, and watching the crime rate closely. It's not directly related to the penal code. Of course, it's an important part of what we do, but I think that just to our, you know, our mission to be as data-driven as possible is to try to, you know, uplift and bring visibility to um, that is important. All right, Tom. Yeah. Continue. Last one, and it's, you know, uh, change of pace a little bit. So this has to do with the Racial Justice Act, which, you know, is a new law, huge law, still a lot to uh, be seen about how it functions in practice. But I think one 
thing that came through loud and clear in March when we heard from, from folks looking at this is we don't even have the information a lot of the time to begin to make a claim under the law. Um, so I think it makes sense to focus some attention there. You know, what, what, where are there areas where there can be more data provided to folks to at least begin to make an initial claim on how the claim gets resolved? That's sort of a question for another day. Um, so uh, we, we, you know, we, we spoke to people, we're continuing to speak to people about some places to do this. And there's sort of um, three big categories to think about this. One is expanding data that's already released. So like uh, when a report comes out making sort of raw, obviously de-anonymized data available for researchers instead of just the, the PDF with the, sort of the graphics at the end, having the uh, information in a, in a more uh, researcher-friendly format. So CDCR, Judicial Council, and the Department of Justice all put out great reports, but they're often talk about things at a statewide level and what you really need for these claims is something a little more local, but obviously they have that data to make the statewide trend uh, analysis. So encouraging or you know telling them to uh, put out that sort of more usable data. And the Department of Justice does this for some of their reports. The RIPA data is a great example. You can download a, a gig of RIPA data and look at every single individual police stop. Um, and a model like that for some other uh, data sets, I think would be helpful. And again, this is data that's already collected and cleaned and analyzed. So not asking too much, I think, in the long run. And the second thing is to limit or to expand access to um, probation and police reports that already exist. And obviously, it's a bit of a different situation because there can often be sensitive information in there. So the idea here is if you're an attorney or someone working for an attorney who's investigating a, or litigating an RJA claim, you basically swear to that and you can get access to this information that um, is very relevant. And in fact, probation reports are available to everybody for the first 60 days and then they sort of um, lock down. So again, it's sort of just uh, building on some of the access that's already there. And same thing with police reports, um, you know, it's just making that access a little bit wider for folks who are, who are bringing these claims. Um, and the third one is, is to fund, um, you know, this is a bit of a mouthful, the Justice Data Accountability and Transparency Act. This was a, a bill that Assembly Member Cholera did last year um, that would require prosecutors to keep certain data and to report it to the Department of Justice, but it's all contingent on it being funded. So, you know, I know we don't, uh, typically make sort of funding recommendations, but this one sort of seems to, to make sense because it would fit in with these goals and it's um, something that we sort of weighed in on before. So those are the five recommendations. That is the end of my slides. Um, any other questions or any other thoughts about those? Yeah, just I would have uh, two suggestions to continue to chew on, which was um, perhaps consider retroactivity for everything. Um, deal with it to deal with Estrada and that whole mess of law and statutes and legislative intent and I just might go that way. Okay. Um, the second is for the resentencing second look calculation that we were sort of fiddling with is in 15 years at any time, et cetera. Then perhaps we might consider the what I'll call the formula that's used for Prop 57, you know, reevaluation at the base term. And that would be another way to talk about, to sort of get at enhancement reform that we've also been talking about over time. I, I um, think we may have made that recommendation already, actually. Oh, <laughs> all right. I thought, we did, I thought we did it after a certain number of years as opposed to a base term. I think we should basically expand it to everyone. And, and for, we'll, we'll take a look. You know, it's late but on we, a Friday. I think that so we I'm had, sure maybe we had it to the parole that the BPH gets regardless. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. No, that's a good one. All right. Any other comments or questions as we move on? Obviously, every member of the committee should feel free to contact staff if they continue to mull these things over. We will continue to chew on them until we uh, make our final recommendations in um, the end, you know, fall for a report and they will come out in December. Yep, great. Without hearing uh, any interruption, I'm going to keep on going. Um, <clears throat> brief word about the schedule for the rest of the year. Um, starting next month, um, it becomes harder for us to meet via Zoom. Staff will work with all of you on scheduling our next meeting, including where we're going to physically meet. Um, it's going to have to be in person, or at least where everybody is has to be open to the public. We'll go over that. Um, I'm anticipating that we'll have more than one meeting uh, covering new topics, <clears throat> and then the smaller ones to approve our recommendations. But just, just a heads up that there's going to be some scheduling issues 
Um, on the one hand, we've been taking great advantage of Zoom. Um, on the other, it'll be good to see um, at least some of you in person, and we're just going to have to work on that. I appreciate everybody's flexibility and understanding, and especially staff, the extra work that's going to take to mount this uh, to do it in person. Mike, why is that? Why is that the case? Is there, is there a kind of a sunset, sun setting to what we're doing? Correct. Yeah, it ends July one, so we made sure to squeeze this one in before. Can you, can you get an extension? I mean, that's going to be really difficult. I know for me in particular. Well, well, there there is a bill that's that's working its way through, but it wouldn't kick in unless something dramatically changes until January one of next year. So we're going to have sort of the, the next six months. But Mike, I don't know if you misspoke, but I think we we talked about having sort of one more meeting like this where we have a lot of witnesses and new topics. And then the sort of final meeting to look at the report. Um, and, you know, obviously we all would love an excuse to come down to LA. So maybe we can, we can make that happen or we'll, we'll figure something out. We, might, we, we might have it in Hawaii. I was just consulting. With <laughs> yeah. And would that apply to witnesses as well, or just the commission? No, just us. And not even staff. So, you know, it's really just you guys who have to have to do it, but. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to have to triple the pay. <laughs> Yeah, that's that 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 actually won't be too hard. That's not that's not the stumbling point. Um, in any event, I just wanted to give you guys give you all a heads up that 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 is coming. Um, so appreciate everybody's flexibility and understanding, and we will make it as convenient as uh, possible for everyone. And hopefully, there will be some benefit to being together. Um, all right, <clears throat> moving on to to the so that's the administrative part of uh, today. Two more items, which are a discussion of today's hearing, including giving recommend, you know, um, I guess direction to staff to start to hone in on some recommendations, and then public comment. Um, so we, I, you know, we had another great uh, meeting today. Thank you, especially to Rick for pulling everybody together. An enorm enormous amount of work. Memo was terrific. You know, I, don't, I can't even count how many people came uh, to testify from really from across the country. Spectacular, and I, I, for one, learned a ton. Um, although we're not making any formal recommendations today, I want to make sure we have some consensus on the direction for staff research. And um, we'll continue to work on these throughout the year and refine our recommendations to our annual report at year's end. Um, so today is merely the first step in the process. So keeping basically the structure of how today went, going, starting with lead and then welfare fraud and then finally fines and fees, Here's what I was able to kind of pull out of the conversation as things that at least, let me put it this way, um, I think that we should start direction, but others should please feel free to chime in. Um, with respect to lead, there seems to be um, really positive bipartisan, multipartisan, whatever, support for expanding it. It is a little bit tricky because it does seem like it's largely a, a funding or a budget um, issue of the services. However, the pilot programs that were discussed that were in San Francisco and Los Angeles that expired just before the pandemic um, were in the penal code. So I think it's within our jurisdiction, with our possibility, even if just to restart those pilots, I think that there was some value <clears throat> um, in what the, um, the person from the, uh, person from the sheriff's office said that merely telling police op police officers can do this today, right? There's nothing preventing them from executing lead, but giving them the direction that they should or that they may actually does provide a bit of uh, train tracks for them to, to work on. Um, I think at a minimum that, and then to, to restart those pilots, perhaps expand it to the rest of the state and seek additional funding. Those are kind of the broad outlines. I don't know if other folks obviously continue to see what's going on in other states, if there are other things that we can piggyback or steal from other places. Other folks have thoughts on lead? Yeah, Assembly Member Brian. I think it's also kind of grappling with kind of the question, one of the questions you had earlier, uh, which is discretion is good, um, um, but also in instances where, you know, mandating somebody to go through lead as opposed to uh, or requiring that they go through lead i just don't i don't know where where to land on that i think that, i think that's a tough uh, that's a tough one and you know what crimes and how much discretion do you want to give to police officers and do you want to say 
I think we want to generally figure out a way to, in a realistic way, expand its use. I think that, and I don't know um, what would be the most effective way of doing that, whether it's mandating certain things or incurred. Well, and it, it, it's expanded its use, but also not have irregularities between jurisdictions, or maybe that's what we need to, to have the information to decide whether, you know, whether something is a, a discretionary problem or a, a design problem in, in the, the way folks are encountering the program. Yeah. I mean, I always think it's weird when we do pilot programs and we're explicitly saying, you know, some counties do it, some counties don't, but um, yeah, Judge Espinosa. Well, I just wanted to respond and say that lead the lead model is completely voluntary um, and that's how we launched in LA and and I was worried about um, police being the gatekeepers um, but my fears were unfounded um, once they were trained on harm reduction and they began working directly with the case managers um, it was transformational for everybody involved and so I just wanted to add that I know it's like so, yeah, I mean, I think that this is an important piece. I would have also been skeptical without saying, police officer, you have to do that for X crime. You have to do this. Um, but it does really seem like people are are buying into it. Um, and my thought was, well, they could do it today. Like, there's nothing preventing a police officer from taking a guy on the street and walking them over to a sir, right? Nothing, there's no law stopping people from doing that. But when you, but apparently it seems that the experience, at least in San Francisco and Long Beach has been, when you say you're not required to, but you can do this and you put that in a statute, that, that actually primes the pump in a way. And I, and we heard from the Sheriff's Department that that sort of gives the police officer cover. Some, some cover. Right, yeah. I think the, the part about the, uh, what the captain said, I think you have to have the police Kind of vested in the program and keep them informed in the loop so it's not just a matter of simply referring them you know to further services but to let them know what the result is keep them in the loop so that they can say hey this guy did okay in the end that's, that seems like absolutely an essential piece i guess that's, that's the purpose of the bi-monthly case management meetings i'm sorry to raise my hand but um Anyways, it's that's the function of those meetings is to get the police and the caseworkers in the room to talk about individual people and how they're doing. Uh -huh. um, you will we, what we found, particularly with the sheriff's department, even with Long Beach PD, is if they found one of our participants who was sort of not doing well, they would call the case managers and say, "Hey, come and talk to this person because they're they're headed in the direction of another arrest." So so it really became a a, a very close working relationship. Anyways. I think the, bot the bottom line is we want to try to find ways to expand this. Um, I think that the question is how to best do that, what's been effective, either in California in the past, elsewhere, where there might be opportunities in the budget or incentivize it. I think we should explore that. Other states that may have implemented similar programs, how they've Im Im implemented it through their state legislature. I, I, you know, Let's run with this one. I think that this is right down our alley in terms of improving public safety and reducing incarceration at the same time on top of saving money. So it's just a bit tricky about, you know, where and how do we do it as a matter of penal code? I think that's gonna be the trickiest piece. All right, any other question, uh, comments on lead? All right, moving on, welfare fraud. Um, here's my takeaway on it. There's some kind of consensus that um, we want to target people who are really trying, intentionally trying to defraud the system. The system is insanely complicated. I mean, it was like hurting my head just to hear about all the different CalFresh, CalWorks, this limit, that limit, $4,375.25, whatever. You know, if you win that in gambling, but 24, you know, just like, and if you send me a piece of paper and told me, like, we gave you notice, then I'm not the best, you know, it just, just seems really, um, I, so <clears throat> at the same time, my initial inclination is if somebody's intentionally stealing, that should be um, a crime. This is if they're intentionally stealing from a supermarket. So I'm, my current inclination is not that we should 
say this is never a crime or raise the limit to $20,000 or some very high number, but to try to hone in on this true intent to defraud, whether that's limiting it to egregious examples that we specify, such as, you know, stolen or fraudulent identities or multiple applications for the same person or something like that, or if we just say that certain <clears throat> act certain activities would not qualify as intent. So for example, notifying in writing is not sufficient to trigger intent. It might be sufficient to, to claw back the money, but it's not sufficient to give you a felony conviction of intent to defraud. But it has to be something more. I don't really know beyond that, but I would focus on that intent piece. That's my three cents. Yeah, I think I think you can go back and forth, right, mm -hmm. with what isn't intent and or more clearly are uh, defining what intent would be, um, which I think would be a, potentially a better lens for the legislature because most of my colleagues won't know that that's what you already need. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I am curious if there are um, guidelines from any other, the big police departments, obviously Riverside, where they feel strongly about this. They don't have written guidelines. Um, on that might be a good starting place if, if there any. Uh, DA's office has useful, but that's just a thought. Anybody have any ideas or thoughts about this? I, I think it's a great starting point. I think thinking of the sort of evidentiary piece of it seems very targeted and, and realistic. Um, I mean, in a way of responding to some of the issues that we've heard about. I mean, I we're all, I think we should all be encouraged that the, the number of prosecutions, arrests has been going down, you know, pr pretty dramatically over the past 10 years, not just COVID related. So it is good, of course. Um, and Tom and I were talking about earlier, this really came, this whole um, um, meeting today, we originally, when we originally conceived of it late last year was an idea to talk about women and families in the justice system. And that's how we came across welfare fraud because this really does seem like an area that's disproportionately, disproportionately affect, uh, you know, impacting women and poor women of color in particular. So I think that it's something that we want to pay special attention to it even though the problem isn't improving. All right, <clears throat> finally. Fines and fees. Talk about confusing and complicated. Um, I think that this could be a full, real overhaul. Um, I agree with, I, I really like the Washington state model. If you're too poor to pay for an attorney, you shouldn't. Being locked up is sufficient punishment. Shouldn't have to pay, period, full stop. Just make a clean start. I wouldn't touch um, traffic fines just because it's complicated. It's also seems to be the bulk of the money. So to, to, to the state, to the extent that people are concerned about losing revenue, um, we, we avoid that problem. And it just seems like the reasonable thing to do. Being incarcerated is, is sufficient. And that's where I would draw the line. Thoughts? Makes sense. I mean, I think we should take a look at it. And I think that this distinction between what's a fine and what's a fee and what's a, you know, that's, that's really playing word games. Yeah. Um, and DNA and, you know, court fee and, you know, come on. Right. That's just play, that is playing games and, and it's absurd. A lot of times it's the tail wagging the dog <laughs> I found with the fees on top. Really Absolutely. Shocking. Absolutely. And just having represented, you know, many people who've been incarcerated, having for, you know, years in prison, and then to come out with, you know, extraordinary bill just seems like um, totally unrealistic that you think that anybody's going to pay it back and it doubly, you know, impedes their ability to uh, re-enter society successfully, to expecting people who are making 19 cents an hour in prison to be paying these fines and fees is also absurd. Um, at the same time, obviously, uh, people who are wealthy or corporations uh, should not be off, off the hook um, if that's, but it should be considered, I think it's part of a punishment. Um, and anyway, that's where I'd be. Any other additional thoughts? 
Um, okay. So, so Mike, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll explore, but it sounds like sort of an ability to pay, more complicated ability to pay thing is doesn't seem too appealing to folks right now versus just, you know, if you have a public defender, which is an ability to pay kind of shortcut, I think, uh, but sort of these things about, you know, poverty guidelines and HUD housing index and all that, um, maybe we, we'll, we'll steer away from that. Just not that's where, that's where I come down because it's already insanely complicated and convoluted. Right. I keep it very simple. Um, and then, okay, we're going to do some, a bit. you could pay for half or not half or whatever. I would just, I would say if you're being incarcerated and you have a public defender, no fine and fee, zero, zero money, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Like, I wonder if you want to limit that to folks who are being incarcerated um, because kind of the research indicating, you know, the lasting kind of collateral consequences for folks who aren't incarcerated, but who are, are sentenced to a sentence of probation, how that similarly impacts employment, housing, all the same issues are present. They're not incarcerated, but similarly, they're having all those collateral consequences. And I, I think the, the fine points need to be worked out because you also don't want to create an incentive where I'm like, I'd rather go to prison, please. Right. Or I could, don't have to pay my fine or fee. Um, so obviously we want to avoid that. But I think that that's a good point. Uh, Rick, perhaps for a criminal conviction, misdemeanor or felony, period, no fine or fee. Yeah, no, I think that's if a you're, great if you're, starting if you're, point. If you're indigent, meaning, and I will take a public defender as being indigent. Well, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that, it, that was part of it, but it was uh, the judge was giving another example where just on 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 principle, if if you've been sentenced to time incarcerated, there's no fine or fee because that you've been sentenced to a cage already. Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. I, I'm easily there. I think what Rick was saying is that there's a large number of people who are just sentenced to parole to probation right. who never are behind a cage. They still gotcha. have a sentence. It's still a punishment. So you're, you're saying if the conviction is misdemeanor or felony, regardless of what the penalty is, but you had a gotcha. Okay, you had a public defender. You have a public defender. <laughs> You can't pay these things anyway. Like, let's, you know, you know if you you really can't, they're not going to recover it. It's going to be a huge debt. I mean, these are not fifteen dollars fees, right? You know, these are a, a lot of money. Um, I think I agree that it's a tax. It's a poor tax. It's a regressive tax. Um, and if we're needing to punish people, let's punish people not based on their wealth. Let's, you know, I don't, I, I don't. Uh, we shouldn't be doing punishing based on well. Now I, I realize I'm wishing away the whole problem of traffic tickets. I'm gonna wish that problem away for another day. I'm making a perhaps illogical distinction, but we're gonna go there. Yeah, it's 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 a we can definitely start with that. That's good. All right. Um and I'd be curious to see what other states are doing. You know, um, I think that Washington State, obviously, I think we were all impressed um, by what we're, they're doing up there. And um, it'd be good to I think that is always useful when we're following other states' examples. Any last words before we move to public comment? Nope. All right, we've come to that part of the show. Um, for those listening by Zoom, to get in line for public comment, please select the raise hand function. If you're calling in, please hit star nine. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and if you make a public comment, your name and or phone number may be displayed as part of the recording. We'll take a minute now to see how many people want to comment and based on that, I will determine how long each person has to comment. Please note also that the committee accepts public comment in writing and that comment can be uh, emailed to committee staff who are on screen right now and whose uh, our emails are on the committee webpage. And while people are queuing, I just want to acknowledge several written comments about welfare for fraud were received by me and I believe other members of the committee and staff. We received over a dozen letters from people in 10 counties um, opposing some of the changes we've discussed today. And we've read those letters, we appreciate them and we hear uh, loud and clear there's a lot of interest in that issue. Um, with that said, We've got four people lined up. Should we get rolling? 
Sure, let's get rolling and let's do uh, two minutes each. Great, Glenn Allen. Hello, committee, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Allen, nice to meet you. Very good, uh, I see my photo's not coming up, but that's uh, Anyway, uh, I'm the chairman of the State Policy and Legislative Committee for the California Welfare Fraud Investigators Association. Uh, quick background, 45 years as a special agent commander with California DOJ, San Francisco Police, and now I'm working welfare fraud for 15 years. And one thing which needs more comments on, the welfare system is not a complex system or burdensome for recipients. It is mind-boggling for people, investigators like myself, coming from law enforcement, the rules are, are totally different. And the eligibility workers who are not mentioned today, there's several thousand in the state that make this system easy for the recipients. The recipients normally will talk for an hour plus to an eligibility worker that goes over a cumbersome 14-page form, 20-page form. But several comments were, were how complex and you need a college degree to understand the forms. Here's a typical, here's two questions that get a lot of people with the intent to defraud into felonies. One question is, who lives in the residence? Put their names down. That's pretty basic that I think most people can understand. The next question is, does anybody have income in this household? Those two are some of the biggest felonies we work statewide because a case runs for a year, someone's making not a lot of money, 8,000 a month, or they're getting 2,000 a month for a family of three, six months, that's at $12,000. It's up into the 20,000s after a year. And that's not just a, a mistake. They, they fill out two different applications that ask those questions. Then they're interviewed, ask the same questions again within the first month of applying. And then six months later, every six months, they're asked the same questions again. Do you have income? Who's in the house? And we find out the children have been gone for two years. They're into the 20,000. Uh, we find out that they've worked for a year and a half. You're into the uh, heavy into the felony area. So again, I argue the eligibility workers carry the burden. They know the regulations. Uh, and then talking about fraud going down, it is not. Uh, that well, needs further discussion. Go ahead. We'd love to we'd love to hear more from you. You obviously are an expert in this area. We're trying to hone in in some area of consensus about trying to find true intent to defraud. Nobody wants to support true intent to defraud the state. So if there's additional information that you can share with us, specifically data, certainly the number of arrests and prosecutions have been going down. Whether or not fraud has gone down is a different question altogether. Yeah, uh, and our, our organization did a study about three or four years ago where we found in the cases assigned to us, there was 30% fraud in the cases that we were able to get to. We only well, got we, to 18%. I just want to try to res respect our time limits. Um, sorry, it, it was, it's much, much better if, for you to submit that in writing. We will absolutely consider and incorporate it into our study and, and report. Thank um, you, run my two minutes? Yes, All thank right. you. Thank you for the right. time. You're welcome. Chris B. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris B, a survivor of harm, and I'm speaking on behalf of two Initiate Justice Inside organizers. So from Dortel Williams, he's incarcerated at Valley State Prison, serving life without the possibility of parole. We thank the panel and guests today, but would like to see multi-prong approaches more on trauma and trauma reenactment, including adverse childhood experiences, which are the missing pieces here when we talk about the link between these underlying issues of harm and healing. But again, thank you. And from Mr. Jasper Stallings, currently an incarcerated citizen serving a 127 year life to life sentence at Valley State Prison in Chowchilla, California. Locking a person up for an excessive number of years has never been the solution to crime. The criminal justice system has created a business in locking people up, ultimately profiting off of mostly the poor, the uneducated, the minorities and undiagnosed mental health patients. Still, criminals act still criminal activities has not changed and the age old lock them up and throw away the keys. Deterrence has never worked and does nothing in the form of helping the victims of that or families that have been impacted by such criminal acts. Provided the re that rehabilitation is prerequisite to freedom and CDCR must award those who have completed those requirements a second chance, an opportunity to go home to become a productive tax paying citizen in society. Programs needed to like 
mental health treatment programs, rehabilitative programming, reentry education, and vocational programs. This will provide a safe and healthy, thriving community. Another issue is our dietary means. We're overcharged just to live here and we make pennies on the dollar. And just for me personally, um, you know, I'm interested in the retroactivity of the five-year prior and was wondering if somebody was charged with three five-year priors, would that also include all three of those five-year priors? I think you're, you're muted, Mike, but I, I, I think the answer would be yes. And obviously it's a proposal we're still developing. That's a good Yeah, point. this is just a proposal, which is just a proposal. This It's not even a proposal yet, Crispy. We appreciate your regular contributions and lifting up voices from folks inside. So it's not even a full proposal that we have yet, but the idea is that, um, well, the current law prospectively would apply to multiple five-year priors. And if we were to make that rec recommendation to make that retroactive, it would apply to multiple ones. Um, but that's still to be decided. Um, the next we have is somebody from CACJ staff. Steve Munkelt, Executive Director of California Attorneys for Criminal Justice. At one time in my career, I was the faculty supervisor of a welfare law clinic handling dozens of administrative overpayment hearings. At another point in my career, I was handling exclusively felony welfare fraud cases. In all of that experience, um, what I saw were, were people who were even with benefits living below the poverty level and the challenges of their day-to-day -day life um, for supporting their family, having food on the table and a shelter for their family uh, were a, a major contributor to the circumstances that led to an overpayment. Overpayments in the thousands of dollars were almost always accumulated over two or three years. So you have a $10,000 overpayment. That meant somebody had a $150, $200 a month more to buy food or get transportation or the basic necessities of life. The, the situation, I, I don't think I saw a single situation in all of that time where somebody appeared to be gaming the system to make a real profit. Um, so, and I would also disagree with the comment that this is a simple system for the recipients. That's just crazy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that there is consensus around the idea that we're trying to find people who are truly gaming the system and 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 not entangle people who are already overwhelming by life situations. It's difficult to write that into statute, and that's going to be our challenge moving ahead. Um, I see we have uh, Naomi Lewis Afriat. If I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I hope I am. That's okay. Thank you for giving me a moment to talk. Um, will, you, will you tell me how to pronounce your name appropriately? Sure, that's uh, Naomi Lewis and then Afriat. Afriat. Yeah, uh -huh. thank you. Um, so I'm with the National Parents Organization, and we're really just trying to kind of um, get awareness about an issue that a lot of parents like myself are having. Um, custodial interference is not really on the agenda right now, but I did just want to report on behalf I am, I am a parent um, that we're being, we're experiencing being denied help by law enforcement and enforcing custodial, um, you know, custodial, um, penal code. So we're just requesting that penal code California 278, 278.5 be placed on the agenda for you guys to take a look at, um, because that's something that is, I'm not the only one. There's a lot of other parents, and I think there might be somebody else waiting to talk as well about this, but it's an issue in a lot of, you know, in a lot of counties, we get told it's a civil matter that they can't deal with. And so I just wanted to kind of bring your attention to that. So we're talking about penal code California 278 and 278.5. Thank you. Uh, I just wrote that down. Thank you for the, for the note. It really, to, especially if you're interested in putting things on the agenda, uh, emailing into us, I think would be the most efficient way, but um, thank you for calling in. Okay, um, thank you. And then finally, it looks like another person or somebody else or somebody from National Parents Organization. Hi, yes, my name's Claudia. I'm here on behalf of National Parents Organization, um, as well as Heroes for Children's Rights. It's an organization that speaks up on issues that impact service members and veterans. And I was calling also to um, request that uh, and the next uh, meeting um, add an agenda item on California Penal Code 278 and 278.5. Um, what it is is that oftentimes when parents have um, visitation or custodial um, orders of cust for custodial time, 
the other parent is denying them. And when they ask for assistance with law enforcement, uh, they're denied any assistance and they're told that it's a civil matter when it's not, it's an actual crime. It's a, it's a felony in, in the state of California. Okay, right, well, like I said, uh, appreciate calling in. Um, if you would uh, email or a short letter, explain the situation more clearly and we'll consider it for our agenda. I really appreciate everybody's time. Thank, um, you. thank you for calling in. Thank you to everybody who's stayed with us, committee members, Tom, Joy, Rick. Thank you so much. Everybody have a good weekend. I learned a ton today. I think we made real progress and um, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. All right, good night. Hi everybody.